Here we go, no, here we go. This time, 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 What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to episode 95 of the Power Company podcast, brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. I have been home in Lander, Wyoming for maybe longer than I have in ever, which is kind of fun. But I am headed to Colorado tomorrow, where I'll be emceeing the World Cup in Vail, which I'm crazy excited about. Um, I just think it's really instructive and fun to watch that caliber of climber, not to mention getting to see what the setters come up with and how the climbers react. And this event sort of kicks off the summer for me. Um, and that's going to be a crazy summer. We've got a bunch of new and exciting things coming, new eBooks, updated versions of the eBooks we already have. Um, we just recently expanded our shipping options to Canada, the UK, Australia, most of Europe, several other countries. Um, teas and tanks are being restocked today. Uh, the machine shop is in its final phases. There may or may not be a book coming. Um, you didn't hear that from me, though. And we've got some new products we're working on. So basically, we're working our asses off here. Um, we also just released a new, cheaper version of our proven plan. Even though we truly believe that coach communication is a massively important part of successful training, some people just don't need it, and we know that. So we created an option without it. Um, if you're interested in that or any of the other training with us, there's a link in the show notes right there on your pocket supercomputer. So check it out. Also, um, I will be at the Perfor Performance Climbing Coach Seminar in Minneapolis at the Minneapolis Bouldering Project, October 10th through 12th. And if you register by June 15th, if you're interested, you can save 300 bucks. It's a great opportunity to learn from a bunch of great coaches, uh, Steve Bechtel, Charlie Maganello, Tyler Nelson, myself. Uh, I believe Neely will be there for this one as well. Um, and I'm not sure what the rest of the lineup looks like, but we're, we're nailing that down right now. So there's also a link to that if you want to register and save that money. Okay, today's episode is the first of several great conversations that I had at the recent the CWA Summit, the Climbing Wall Association Summit. And I was introduced to Ryan Gagnon, who is a, a researcher at Clemson University, who is a rare blend of data-driven uh, and extremely infectiously enthusiastic. No offense, data people, but you know it's rare. We all know it's rare. Uh, he'd put together a program to try and get minority youth engaged in climbing, and I found it fascinating, not to mention his enthusiasm for it was off the charts. And because... I know little about the challenges that a climbing gym might face with implementing a program like this. I brought my friend Valerie in as well. Um, but I'm just going to let them introduce themselves and let's jump into this thing. If they want it, they'll come and do it. They'll find a way. But if they don't even know about the way, what are we doing? You know, like our job is to responsibly grow the sport of climbing. And if we're not targeting that group, then we're, we're foolish in that endeavor. Um, how about you both give me... Just a quick intro of who you are, Val. Let's start with you. That way I can just get levels while you're kind of telling me who you are. Oh, and, and then we'll get going. So I'm Valerie McDonough. I manage RockQuest Climbing Center in Cincinnati. And I've been in the climbing industry for about 20 years now. And it's been really interesting. 
watching it grow and being a part of it, it's pretty exciting. Only 20 years. You're like a youngster. I know. We can't all be as experienced <laughs> as you. I'm old. You don't have to it's sugarcoat wisdom. it. Wisdom. Um, and Ryan? Yeah, I'm Ryan Gagnon. I'm a f- in my second year now as an assistant professor at Clemson University in the Department of Parks, Rec, and Tourism Management. And um, I've been in climbing since like college, so, so like 2010, maybe nine. Um, and I also work as the research advisor for USA Climbing. And what I do there is I do process improvement. So how can we make the sport experience better and different for new and continuing participants? And then um, I research a lot of stuff relating to climbing. Am I holding this wrong? All right. You're, I don't know how to. You're totally fine. All right. You just, you just do what you did this morning. Okay. So. Breathe into the mic. So, right. so Valerie and I both sat in on a class that you taught this morning, mm-hmm. and and before I even had come to the class, your your enthusiasm and your passion for for this program that you've put together really touched me and caught me. I was like, I, I walked away from that first conversation, going, "What can I do to be involved in this?" You know, and that's one hundred percent because of your passion for it and that bled through into the the presentation 100 percent and i think it's a really interesting way to look at it maybe only because i'm standing on the outside and i have no idea how to look at it like how do we do this um and we're gonna you know i'm just gonna try to facilitate the conversation between you two because val i know you're interested in putting some sort of a program like this into effect at RockQuest, and you've got a good population for it uh, around the gym. And Ryan, you've seen success in this this program, and and it seems that it could be successful in a lot of places around this country and in this industry. So right, yeah. So Ryan, can you first tell us just a little bit about what the what the program is, the Rise program? Yeah. So I think um, I, if it's all right, I'll just give some. How did I get here? Yeah, yeah. Um, do it. So. I, I cold called Keenan, who's the CEO of USA Climbing, um, about four years ago um, as a new PhD student. And I wanted to um, figure out how to get more people that don't look like me in the backcountry. And for me, the transition to the outside was from an indoor climbing gym. And so I thought, USA Climbing, they're the NGB. I had a buddy who told me to call Keenan, and yep. he gave him some, some bona fides for me, is what he did uh, to Keenan. And then I called him and he answered and I shared with him what I was doing. And he was like, well, I'm going to do some data collection in like two weeks. Can you help me? Um, and that led to a bunch of different projects. And, but this kind of was always on my mind on how can we do this? And so what, uh, what, what we started is like prospecting gyms in the Clemson area on like how, how stoked are they about something like getting minority youth engaged in climbing. And I almost universally people want to do it. And they like the idea of it, but no one actually does it. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's a better analogy, but like teenage get togethers, everybody talks about it, but no one's actually doing it. But everybody's afraid to do it. Yeah. And so, (laughs) and so when I think about the teenage get togethers analogy, which is terrible, um, but I I don't see a lot of it actually happening though. Yeah. Yeah. And And I I think that's where I'm coming from. Like, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, in Lander, where I live, we would love to get more Native Americans yeah. involved, but we don't really know where to start. Right. So the idea stops there. Yeah. And so it's, it's easy to talk about. But the thing that um, people struggle with is how do I start it? And so the first thing is, is well, we'll, we'll en- enhance our marketing. And so they'll put pictures up of, you know, people of color, the one or two that are at their gym right. on the marketing or the person in the wheelchair. Mm-hmm. They'll do that. Um, and they think that will help, but that's marketing, that's spray. That's not what we're trying to accomplish. And then, um, maybe they'll go out and they'll offer scholarships. But what we think about is a scholarship for you and I, like, oh yeah, you could go to college and you get a scholarship, you apply for it. Others think of it as kind of a barrier or like a certificate of shame. Like you can't afford to be here. So we had to do special things for you. Sure. And so often it just kind of runs out there. Or um, what we'll do is we'll have a gym, um, do a one and done program with a school that needs some extra help, but then there's no follow on. And so uh, what we did with Rise is we really tried to develop a relationship with that partner at Best Academy, Maria Bell, and her principal, Dr. Tim Jones, Um, just telling them about it and then 
just giving them a little bit and then have them come out and see what climbing is about and kind of alleviating some of their concerns with climbing being risky as compared to other sports, what have you. But all the while we were, we were co-developing this program. Like what is, how are kids going to be better and different because they participate in this? Um, and so we had that message in our minds the whole time. It wasn't to make them a 5'11 or 5'12 climber. It was to make them a climber and, right. and for the ones that it resonated with. And so that's how we, we started. And so we chased some dollars and we got some stuff going and we got Stone Summit in Atlanta to buy in. We got USA Climbing to buy in. Um, we got uh, some money from Cliff or some stuff from Cliff Bar. Um, and I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, the Brooks Sports Science Institute at Clemson gave us some money. And so, but what you're hearing is like I had six people that were on the line the whole time. And so I had to manage all of that stuff. Um, and it, and what ended up happening is, you know, we figured it out and we were flexible. And so every week, and today is actually the last day of the program, sadly, um, until we find some more money um, to keep it going into the fall. And so we'll be as a traditional after school sport, a climbing sport, but we just happen to have, be all African American kids. And how, how long did the program last? 10 weeks. 10 weeks. Yep. And we, we found out we got money, and then literally two weeks later, we were running. And okay. so we were getting school buses scheduled, uh, parent waiver signed. That was one of the biggest scrambles was trying to figure out how to get that signature. So Stone Summit isn't on the hook. Clemson isn't on the hook. Best Academy isn't on the hook. You know, like that was, you know, a little difficult, but that was a hurdle that we expected because we work in youth programs. And so in youth programs, getting signatures is difficult. Sure. So we knew that was going to happen. Yeah, you, had, you, you said something in there that you talked about in your presentation and, and when we had a conversation the other day that I really liked, um, that it wasn't just diversity marketing, you're actually going out and recruiting. Yeah. And, and you you gave the analogy of the Clemson football team. Yeah, so um, that's, it's perfect. So Dabo Sweeney, our football coach, when he wants a player, he goes and gets them. Right. And with... Um, with diversity marketing, it's just marketing. It's just spray. And so when Dabo wants somebody, he goes and gets them. And that's what we did. So we went to Best and we said, hey, what are the things we need to make happen to make this work? And right. we were, quite frankly, worried that no kids would sign up for it. Like, that was the thing. Like, we put, you know, if you build it, they will come. And so we removed every constraint that we could. And we were worried that, that we wouldn't get. The, and then we had way too many butts for the number of seats we had. Right. And so that was a pleasant surprise. And it just shows me that some of the... I'm sorry for going off on my... No, 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 do it. Yeah, do it. It, it just shows me that some of the barriers that we have, that we perceive it's a white sport, it's too expensive, they won't want to do it culturally, those are just BS. Like, they right. wanted to do it because they're kids and they want to climb and they want to screw around, right. just like I did, just like all of us did. And so, that was... Yeah. Now, those reasons... And Val, feel free to jump in anytime. Don't wait for me to call on you. If you have a question, just jump in. Um, those reasons that that you just cited it's too expensive it's too dangerous it's a white sport whatever those are those are pretty common hurdles mm -hmm. um, that you talked about in your presentation and and you have responses to those right off the bat which i think right. is a really smart way to approach it you know know what the the problem is going to be and already have a solution for it so yeah we try to anticipate the problems and so like when val and i talk in a couple weeks about how to make this happen like um like, what are the things that you're going to encounter no matter what? And like, oh, that's crazy to do that. But then they see a gym that's completely full. Well, there's a lot of crazy people then, you know. Um, uh, it's a white sport. It's the one we hear a lot. But like football is, was, is a Yale sport. Started as a very white sport. Yeah. yeah. Uh, basketball was invented by a white guy in Canada. And for a long time, black people weren't allowed to play. Right. Um, and then soccer, like I had to make sure of this. There's some debate, but soccer was invented in England. And England is now known for its diversity, but wasn't when it was invented. Right, sure. And so those things, like, that's the first rebuttal I have. But the other ones are like, it's dangerous. Then we just have to talk about your kids playing tackle football. We need to look at ratios. We need to look at evidence, right? A mm -hmm. rope is scary, but a rope is strong. It can hold a Toyota Corolla. You right. know, like that climbing hell or that tackle football helmet isn't going to stop a concussion. Right. And so we sure. forget that. Yeah, I think um, another big takeaway that I thought was really good was when you were talking about the parent who was like, well, how come these kids are climbing for free, but I'm paying all of this money. And I feel like that could be perceived as a kind of a general sentiment. Yeah. Depending on 
the community at the gym, you know, how receptive they are, how empathetic they are to the world around them. But um, I thought that your response to that was really great. But then also, um, just as a general, like how that benefits not only the climbers that are already in the gym, but the benefits to this community, which will then go out and become part of your, you know. Right. Yeah. You have a broader social network is the one part. So like, I really struggle with it. Like, quite frankly, when I had that parent come to me, like, I was pissed off. Right. And I was like, we're doing this amazing thing. And I just had this moment with a a kid right before I had that conversation where he's like, Dr. Gagnon, I made it to the top today. And he's a little bigger kid. And that would, that was his goal by the end of the program. And then I had this mom that's, you know, an over parent and there's a lot of benefits to that. And she came in and she was, she was, well, I don't understand why they go for free when I pay X number of dollars a month. And, and I had to, I had to reframe my thinking very quickly. Um, and, so the first thing I did was just talk about exposing our kid to new groups, escalating competition level, getting new people on board, um, and it, like serving that community because that's what we're you know we're trying to be inclusive. But then I talked to a, a a colleague at Clemson about it and just like debriefing that experience, and um, I I needed to turn that enemy into a friend. She's an over parent, so she's heavily involved. She knows the system. She can uh, navigate barriers that I might not anticipate, and so what I've started to do is leverage her energy to actually facilitate those kids first climbing competition and so i'm taking her negativeness i guess and reframing it and so now she's overly bought in and trying to chase dollars for me like now i have emails from her what about this grant ryan right and like that but that over parenting i just shifted it on to me versus them and part of it i think on us is like climbing stakeholders is we have to be able to communicate that quickly and and some people are not going to be pleased with it, but it's the same th- argument that we have about maybe affirmative action or those kind of things. Like we have a systematic oppression of a group. And so we have to figure out a way to build them back up. And so that's where like th- there's rebuttals to that as well. So yeah, I, th- I think that's a really valuable, um, a valuable asset to have is to be able to turn what could have been an enemy into an advocate and, and I think that's a really great way to do it. Leverage their strengths, mm-hmm. you know, see what it is that that they're really good at and that they love and that they really identify with and try to leverage that for yourself and, and for the program. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to that same, you know, to her point, to I, I, I grew up as someone who didn't have a lot of opportunities, a ton of advantages in my mind. Um, now I look back and realize that I had more opportunities than I thought I did. So I've always been this like tough love, pull yourself up, yeah. you know, kind of a person. And what's your response to that? It might be better for those kids to learn that way. Pull and, themselves up by their bootstraps. Right. And I, and I don't yeah. necessarily no, no, yeah. subscribe to that, but I have in the past. Well, it's it, the idea behind it is like, yeah, you should, you should, like for me, I had to have a job in high school. So I had to spend my own money and that sort of thing. And so I had to struggle a little bit. So I'm better at managing money now. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't pull up yourself by your bootstraps if you don't have bootstraps. You don't have boots. Right. Yeah. And so that's the other part of it is like you, or you don't even know how to get there or you have $400 and $800 in bills and you have to go to the payday loan and your car just broke down and now your kid's sick. Like, like our, our experience, like is it, my experience has been vastly different than that, right? Like I grew up in a military family. We always had food in our bellies and a house over our head, right? right. So um, how do we empathize with this um, experience? Like if they want it, they'll come and do it. They'll find a way. Mm-hmm. But if they don't even know about the way. Right, totally. What do you, what do you even, what are we doing? You know, yeah. like our job is to responsibly grow the sport of climbing. And if we're not targeting that group, then we're, we're foolish in that endeavor. Yep. Yeah. And I asked that because I know that that's going to be a question from the people who have the money that you're trying to get, um, yeah. you know, and have the, the resources that you need to make these programs yeah. work. Um, and, and what's nice about some of those, those partners or potential partners is they know who we're working with. And right. they and they know that they don't have bootstraps often, but they don't see the connection between climbing and all of the cool outcomes that we have. Right. And so mm-hmm. that's the other part too is like framing what is we're trying to accomplish, right? Like why do you want kids to climb? 
why not go play soccer or play hoops or whatever? And the first one is it's us against the wall versus us versus each other. Right. So you and I go play soccer. I'm going to try and beat you or you're going to try and beat me. But when you and I go climb a route and you fail and you fail and you fail and I fail and I fail and I fail and then you get it, we got it. It's us against the wall. And that's yeah. something that's special about the sport and what's unique about the sportsmanship there. Yeah. It's really us against setters, right? And so <laughs> they might think that way. And Damn the setters. <laughs> and But that's just something that's so special about it that we have there. And I mean, bouldering is problem solving. It's literal problem solving. And so when you put that in the context of academic performance or the development of resilience or the realization of resilience and grit, so you yeah. know how you can accomplish something after you pursue it diligently over time, yeah. then other things seem less big. Yep. Um, and so that's, I think the other part too, is you have to be ready to share that story at the same moment that you're sharing the other story. Yeah, I think the life lessons in climbing are hugely important. Um, and and it's a fun way for kids to learn those lessons. So, I mean, I think that's a, if nothing else, that's a reason for these programs to exist. Um, you also had several other whys mm. um, that might appeal more to the the business owners. Yeah. And, you know, can we talk a little bit about those? Why would you have this program? Yeah, like when I, I thought about Valerie, like you work at a for-profit gym, right? Like you guys are trying to make money and feed families and that sort of thing, right? Ideally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a business decision to reflect the community that's developing across the country. So right now, um, in 2045, we'll have a non-white majority in the country, right? And by 2030, um, I think it's 37% or, what, or uh, more youth athletes will be non-white than white. But in competition climbing, we're at or below 9%. So the general population is at 37% right now. And we serve 9% of that 37%. Right. Um, and so if you want to sustain your business. We're, we're lower than hockey, right? Yes, we're lower than hockey. That's shocking. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and it's funny because like I'm against white sport designations. Yeah. And so like hockey is one of the ones that come in my brain. But like yeah. they're being very intentional about, they're not just spraying marketing. They're going and doing it and they're putting money and time behind it. Right. And we at USA Climbing have to do that right now. We're in crisis. And that was something I tried to emphasize in the presentation is like, if people were decking every week, if people were falling climbing every week, we would be, we would be meeting at CWA and we'd be trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Or we'd have a lot more true blues or something like that. Right. But we, we don't have the minority representation that we need. We're in crisis today. We're already behind the 12 ball or whatever I want to call it. The eight ball is not even in our purview yet. <laughs> right. And right. so that's like there's an urgency behind the program too or the, the targeting that group if we want to sustain our sport. Well, We're blown sure. up. Because if you don't incorporate it now, that population is going to find something to do with their time. Yes. And if it's not climbing, it's going to be something. So. We need to develop the role models. Right? right? Like we can only put Kai on a pedestal so many times, right? Like we have a couple non-white climbers that are really good. And when they age out or they change sports or whatever they do, we don't have that. And so if we're thinking about 2030, we need to have some eight-year-olds that are climbing tomorrow, right? That right. are like starting to pull hard. And so we can have those advanced climbers when we're an Olympic sport and, you know, hopefully continuously. And so we need that. Uh, my buddy made a really cool observation. He's like, when you look at the Chinese gymnastics team, what do you see? A bunch of Chinese people, right? But when you look <laughs> yeah. at the USA gymnastics team, what do you see? You see the best of it's, us. You see yeah. every race that you can think of. Yeah, it's been a very mixed team for, yeah. since I was involved. And we kick ass at gymnastics consistently. Yeah. We almost always, we have to compete against ourselves for gold medals. But that's because we have a diverse <clears throat> sport. So we raise each other up and that's what we need in climbing. Um, that's how we're going to succeed. That's the advantage of America versus China is we have a lot more diversity. So Right. Sure. Um, you said something earlier about, and I completely agree that these kids coming in, African-American kids, Latinx kids, mm -hmm. whatever it is, um, need role models that, that look like them. Yeah. And, and we don't have that currently. No. Um, so how do we go about that? Are we, are we trying to bring people into that now to become those role models or do we go out and look for role models 
Um, how do we do it for those kids coming in right now? Well, so the kids that are coming in right now, they don't really have it besides Kai. And what was so cool right. is like, I caught a kid watching YouTube on his phone and he was watching a climbing video. Uh-huh. You know, like that's when you know the kid's hooked, when he's looking at how yeah. a hand placement works, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's when you know. And Kai was the one doing the hand placement. He was, it was one of the videos where he's climbing 550 or whatever, and he's just <laughs> doing it on a pinky and making everybody go, ugh. Um, but Kai's a role model, but the re- that's why I'm, I'm thinking competition climbing rather than non-competition climbing is actually a little bit more uh, structured for role model development. Sure. Um, because we have the opportunity for this kid to publicly succeed. Um, on potentially a national or international level. And so I think they'll rise up if we can get them in the door. And so, but we have to remove that structural constraint and then we'll just, we'll, we'll have them, we don't have a lot of role models yet, but we'll get there. And so, and Kai isn't from the same circumstance that these kids are from necessarily. Right. Like, the, the, like he probably has a tough, you know, he's a single mom and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But these kids like don't have the resources to drive six hours ever. And so like that is right. like they have even a, a bigger barrier. And so like seeing Kai, like that he might not be representing their their moment or their people. And so that's another part of it too. Um, yeah, I do think, you know, having gone to a lot of gyms around the country doing workshops and seeing that there are, the, the coaching community is becoming more diverse. Mm-hmm. I think that's really important yeah. for these kids coming in to have great coaches and, um, just other local climbers. It doesn't need to be necessarily a Kai or a Megan Martin yeah. um, to be a role model. You know, my role models weren't the professional climbers. Mm-hmm. You know, they were people closer to me that I could relate to more. Um, so, so definitely, I think those coaches, those um, front desk workers, those, yeah. whoever they are at the gyms can accept those roles to some degree. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, we're starting to see that, like, at Stone Summit, we, we have some staff that are non-white, which is great. Um, I, I think when I go back to when I play a sport when I was a kid, I wanted to be Drew Bledsoe on right. the Patriots. Right, And I wonder, like, when that kid was watching YouTube, was he pretending to be Kai while he was climbing? Right. You know, and, totally. like, you, you have that hero, and so, like, that aspiration, and... Or that, you know, I'm Michael Jordan. I'm wearing Jordan right. shoes. Like, right. now there's a Kai shoe, right? Yeah. And so, how do we... But that's where I think that athletic role model... But that I come, like, I'm a guy. And so, maybe that's how it works for me. And I, I think it does work for females, too. I just... I'm not a female. Like, <laughs> did you want to be a female athlete? Like, was there a person you looked up to or... Like, oh, yeah. At every female athlete. No, yeah. like I told Chris, I'm I'm a total fangirl. I'm waiting to see Lynn Hill today. So <laughs> is she here? <laughs> yeah, she's here. She's gonna be in the women's panel. Ah, I want to go to that. That'll I'm be gonna, cool. I'm gonna oh, you are a fangirl. Have to. <laughs> yeah, 1993, right? Right. right. There we go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or even like you said, the gymnastics team. Was, yeah. You know, that's huge. When the yeah. we'd watch the Olympics every time, watch them. You Kids know the names. Goal, that's then, weird. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So Val, let's talk a little about your situation and I'd love for you to chime in, Ryan, with any ideas and how Val might be able to make this work. And the reason I want to do this is just for other gym managers, program directors, gym owners, whoever it is that's listening that is right now saying, well, my situation's a little tougher than Ryan's and I don't think it can work. Let's go through your situation at least a little, Val, and and see how we kind of work through the the cruxes of that. So sure. So um, one of the reasons that we want to do this is the school district that Rockwest is actually located in is one of the more diverse schools in the state of Ohio. Right, which um, is the school district I graduated from. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, go Vikes! Right. Go Vikes! <laughs> so just being in that community and seeing these kids and seeing what they are exposed to, aren't exposed to, and, um, you know, just some of the Mm -hmm. gaps between activities and resources. We want to reach out and kind of within our immediate community, address some of those and invite people in. Um, but we have had programs and like you said, the, the one and done kind of every two years we get a group in and, um, from Cincinnati public, which is, yeah. You know, probably outside of Columbus, the most diverse. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, are probably not even diverse, just 
It's mostly African American. Mostly, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, and I've even had kids. I had a fifth grader come in and tell me that he couldn't climb, and I, you know, asked him why, and he said, "Black people don't do this." You know, and that just breaks your heart. You're like, no, no, no. And, you know, of course, by the end of the day, he was on the wall and loving it. Yeah. And it was great. But. But it's a one and done. Right. And a one and done. And how do yeah. we get them in? And I know just some of the hurdles with trying to get groups in before to like, hey, experience this. Number one is transportation. Mm-hmm. And number two is liability. Mm-hmm. And like you said, the difficulty in the waivers. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a parent guardian. Sometimes it's, you know. Word of the state. Right. Yep. So it's, you know, who do we address with this? So yep. So tell me what you did to get over some of those hurdles. So um, to paraphrase, the barriers are how do we get past one and dones? Um, how do we uh, get rid of the waiver issue, which is an important one? And how do we um, go go longer, right? Is that, right. Does that sound right? Yeah. All right. So... Um, the, the transport issue is the hardest one, right? And so how do you get a regular program going is what you're trying to do. And so I think sometimes we're kicking out of our coverage when we try and have 75 kids come to a wall or whatever it is. And so when I think about that, I'm like, I'd rather have six kids come to my wall and just experience it. And so I can show that program champion, that teacher who helped make it happen. Cause invariably, if you have the Cincinnati one you just mentioned, somebody at that school helped to make that work. They bought in enough to do that. Mm, to right. even yeah. Because they, they could just bail or ghost you and not do anything with it, right? Right. So they cared enough. And so how can I foster that little seed into a big tree? And so what we have to do is we have to bring that person in over and over and over again and get ready for a lot of no's before we get the yes. And so um, what happened at in Atlanta is it, was, it wasn't no's. It was almost an immediate yes. It was just she was too darn busy to hook up with me. And right? this was and, your program champion, yeah, right. Marie? Uh, Maria Bell. Maria Bell. Yeah. Okay. And so Maria Bell is a public school teacher in the Atlanta public school system. And she um, she's my program champion. And um, she's... What she did, though, is like she, she was just too darn busy. And so she came to me with a very small project, actually, that we blew up into a bigger one. Um, but it was from tiny, tiny, frequent conversations. And then me actually reaching out and physically going there and learning more about BEST, even though that doesn't seem like the right use of my time because I want to get them climbing. Um, I had to spend that capital with her to make it happen. And I also had some established trust because I I showed her that I could do it and we're going to go big on this. And then I had others in the community who spoke to Clemson's bona fides, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, So that's the first part. And so you already have that though. If you have the big group coming, you have someone there that's helping facilitate it. It might be just a date on the calendar for them, but you can make it more. Um, Transport's a pain in the butt. Um, and, but it's something that we encounter in all out of school time programs. It's not just climbing. And so, um, Atlanta public schools is very reasonable for their price. I thought it would be a lot more to rent a school bus. I just, I thought it would, and it wasn't, um, I'm not going to share how much it was, but it was less than I thought it was. Um, and so we have the school bus driver that we have to pay. We have to pay the mileage and however long the bus is out for. So four hours plus one, right? Um, And so instead of targeting all the public schools, which is kind of where my head went to immediately, I targeted a school. And so that was the other part that happened is, is like, I could have gone to AP or Atlanta public schools, target all of them and say, bring any kids you want and I'll, and I'll host them at stone summit. But then I would just be so busy and so overwhelmed that I wouldn't be able to make the meaningful connection I have to make. And it would end up being a one and done. One and done. And so instead, I started small-ish, like by targeting ba- Best Academy. And Why did you choose Best Academy? Because we had a PhD student who was doing a project there, and so they established trust with us. Because it's un- it's reciprocal, right? Like if they're going to bail on me, because if you if you offer something <clears throat> free, um, people don't often sign up for it. But if you charge right. five bucks, they'll show up, right. Right? right? Right. And so like we, I needed to know they were going to commit if we did it. And when speaking with uh, Principal Jones and with Maria Bell. Um, I, I knew that they were going to do it if I could find the money. And so that's, that's where I stayed up late and wrote that, you know, that grant application. So it spoke to a scientist and to a practitioner at the same time. And I was willing to put in extra time to do that, to fund it. Yeah. Um, 
So that the first part there, the waivers is just something we have that happens at Without Risk Youth all the time. Any program we have waivers for, right? But the hard part is it's complicated because you have sometimes a public school waiver on top of the, the gym specific waiver. And if you worked with me, you'd have a Clemson waiver, right? And so you have those three things. So how do we condense that document and get it done? And um, we had some kids who just couldn't participate because they couldn't get it. And they had parents at home that could. And so Maria had personal relationships with most of the kids, so she knew their home situation. So, oh, they're a ward of the state or something like that. We have to get a different waiver system done for them. Oh, someone at the school can sign for it because their parents are out or whatever. And so we had them negotiate that for us, but that would never have happened if Maria didn't do it. Right. right? And so like, but we had to, so I had to spend that time just hooking in, hooking in, hooking in with her just to see how she's doing, make jokes, be silly with her, and then like, that's what the key part was because she could just bail any day and that would be the end of it for me. Um, and I can't say the same, like Stone Summit would try and keep going if they could, um, if I bailed. So she's the reason that it's going, not me at all. <laughs> well, a little bit, 5%. So, um, but the waiver thing, I don't have a good answer for you. Like, it's just, you're going to have some kids who don't have it and, but you need it right? And you need it signed. And now that we're moving to e-sign stuff, like Stone Summit had to create a Word doc one that they right. could print off and sign right. because they don't do that for right. a good reason because it's a pain to tr keep track of. Right. But we did it because Stone Summit cared. So they bought in, you know, and then USA Climbing didn't really have to do any electronic paperwork until we got the membership stuff started. So right. that was easy. Um, yeah. I didn't answer your questions necessarily. <laughs> I apologize. Well, one important answer I think you did was that um, Val already has this this group coming there. Yeah. And I think that's huge. And I think a lot of gyms do have these one and done yeah. sort of, you know, classes or groups coming in. Right. And the person that facilitates that, you're right, is is a really good potential candidate to for you to turn into a program champion right. if you can. Um, Val, do you know of groups in the Cincinnati area that would be interested in this kind of thing? Are there groups that already exist where you could tap into someone to become a program champion? So um, I know there are a few resources available. Mm -hmm. um, the one of the teachers that comes out, I know I could reach out to her and be like, hey, because she's actually brought her kids in outside. Yeah. So, but it's that time thing, like you said, where I have to figure out how to nail her down. And, yeah, because she's got a lot going on. Right, and get the buy-in. And How do you make this a priority for her over other things she's got going on? Right, right. right. Um, and, yeah. So that's one of the things. Um, there's also, there's a huge church in Cincinnati that does a amazing program. Um, they do this whiz kids program. So they're already out into these communities mm -hmm. and have connections. And so there's, you know, potential resources there, um, that we could, you know, find. And there's even within that same community, there's a huge amount of climbers. So they're already in to the climbing community and can bridge the gap as yeah. well. So. It, and I think what we could do, like if you, we found some money to pay for the program and you flew me out. I would try and get a program with eight or nine people going and that's it. And that doesn't help me as a scientist necessarily, but it does help me like start that spark and we'd pilot it and see how to keep the kids going. Cause what I'm interested in is knowing why they keep going and why they don't. Right. Um, and so I, I keep pushing like for that eight or nine or 12 or whatever. I pick 12 because that's how many fit in a, a bus or a van. Right. Right. And then you have the teacher and the chaperone driving and then that's all you got. And how can we if I say, hey, Stacy, the program champion, the theoretical one, I have money to pay for you to come every week, but I need someone who can come consistently every week and I have money to pay you for your time. And that's another layer, too, is like you do need to like that's not a carrot for a lot of people that work in youth programs because we didn't get into it for the money. Right. But you do need to pay them for their time if you can. And if right. you're not doing this thing, they, you know, if they're doing this thing, they're not doing something else, right? Either time with their family or they're not working on stuff they need to work on. And so if you can hook them up with like an hourly rate, that's more than they make at the school, which isn't difficult for teachers, unfortunately. Um, 
then you you can bridge a gap. But you have to you have to you have to pay some money to do that. Where and, does that money come from? Right. So we got a grant <laughs> um, right. to pay for part of it, and now I'm at CWA. Like, what do people out? even look for to find a grant? Yeah. Like so that? like, uh, North Face just had a call out called the Explore Grant, which uh, okay. knock on some kind of wood somewhere. Um, <laughs> hopefully, we get <laughs> because that wood. will fund us for the next year. Um, and like, Outdoor Research has a grant that just came out. Um, so they're these. They're not small, but they're smaller. Twenty five grand or ten thousand dollars. And then there's your your budget at your gym. Right. And that's where it, it can come from, too. If like that's what you want to commit to doing and that's your service thing, like um, during our presentation, um, something that came up that was really cool was that guy who said a percentage of our profits go towards minority engagement programming. Right. Right. I thought at the that end. was awesome. And it was like that mitigates like two or three of those constraints where the parents are you know, mad because they're paying and others aren't or whatever. And it also like sets up this intentional design. Right. Yeah, and from the business perspective, it's a it looks good for the business. Oh yeah, that's to be able to say that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's exactly mm-hmm. right. It looks very good for the business to talk about like how they're helping the community. Right, and often that's tax deductible. Like they are exactly. businesses, and so there's yeah. another layer that can come into that too. Right, and I feel like what you said too is also a huge part of that. Like almost like put your money where your mouth is. Like right. you fund what you value, you value what you fund. Right, so, right. I think that's a valuable statement. Yeah. I got that from my advisor, Barry Garston. He got it from somewhere else just because I'm a scientist and I cite my sources. <laughs> I did not come up with that. Um, but that is like, it's, it's very apt. Like where you spend your time is where, how I know who you are. A good way to ask a person that runs an out-of-school time program what they do is ask them what would happen if you didn't do it. So if you went away, what would happen to that community? Those right. are your outcomes. Right. Right. So like, well, kids would start screwing around. They get in gangs, whatever it is. That's what your mission and vision is. And so what is it you're trying to accomplish? And so I think that goes back to the why. What is your why? Like you have to figure out why you want these kids in the climbing program. And then that will put, they'll get you other energy. But it should be very difficult to know what your why is. It, it's not, if it's easy, then it's probably not your real motivation for doing it. Or you're just trying to check the diversity box. Right. And it doesn't seem like you are because we're doing this right now. And you went to a talk <laughs> and you came to CWA and all that stuff. Now, you right. said earlier that even if you were gone, Stone Summit would continue it. Yeah. What's, what's the carrot for them? Why, why would Stone Summit continue to do it? I mean, they, they are a business. Yeah. Um, are they... Is it just so that they look good? And I'm not, I'm not trying no, to yeah, disparage no, Stone Summit no, yeah. at all, but is it just because they look good? Are they making money off of this? How does it work for a business just because business people are going to be listening to this and the more benefits that you can provide when you approach your gym owners yeah. with this program, the more likely this kind of program is to get off the ground. It reminds me of when Patagonia told us to not buy their stuff. Right, totally. So everybody <laughs> wanted to buy Patagonia stuff. <laughs> All I wanted stuff. to do was do that, right? <laughs> and so why does, why does, like, I can't get into Darren or Daniel's brain on why they want to, uh, they're the owners of Stone Summit, sure, why sure, they want sure. to, uh, why they want to do it. But the reason why easy is because it's the right thing to do mm-hmm. because they've been very fortunate in their business and now they can help others experience the thing that's so special to them. Absolutely. But those are kind of generic answers, right? Like, why do you want to do it? Because I, if I get more of these groups in my gym, I'll make more money. Like, if you have African-American kids in your gym, you might lose money on the minority engagement program. But when people see people that look like them yeah. there, they're going to start to go. Right. You know, you might have that rich uncle or whatever it is is like yeah it's crazy let's go do it and but he can afford it he has a cadillac escalade like he has a nice car or something like that that's mm-hmm. the car of atlanta is the escalade <laughs> um and the official car of yeah. atlanta <laughs> and so they he could go and then he could buy a membership or a day pass or something like that but when we reflect the community we intend to serve or should serve so 37 percent of the population is non-white then we're going to make more money by doing that. And so there is a a business incentive there, right? Like, and it, it, it feels so good. (laughs) It's another part too. Like it, uh, I don't know what the, the, we call them squirts, but they're this, uh, this chemical that releases in your brain. You know, like when you get a like on Facebook, you get a little bit of it, but like when you see a kid accomplish something that never would have been able to do it without all of you getting together to make him do it or her do it, it's magic. And that's something that we don't get 
a lot. Like, um, that's why the audience was weeping during the presentation when I talked about that. Remember when everybody weeped? Right, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I was weeping. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think for, because Chris and I have actually talked about this before he moved away to Lander. Uh-huh. We talked about um, inner city kids and, you know, that that whole statement, like you said, of the, the McEnroe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So do you want to say what the McEnroe statement was? I, see, I feel like you should. So this is attributed to McEnroe. But I'm not sure if this is the correct source, but the next Wimbledon winner is a kid in inner city Chicago who's never held a racket. Yeah. And I right. was I was actually just looking on my phone because I posted a photo of your initial slide and just said early to class because I'm a nerd, you know. Uh-huh. And and the first question I got was, Do you think five sixteen is in the foreseeable future? Because your presentation was called Towards Five Sixteen. Yeah. And you had us during the presentation talk to the people around us that we didn't know and give reasons why a program like this should exist. And my reason was immediately because I'm a coach, I'm a trainer. I I come from a high school that, that was at least half African American. So I've spent a lot of my life with African American athletes. And some people are going to get mad at me generalizing like this, but African American athletes possess the attributes to be really great rock climbers. Kai has like a plus six or seven reach on his hands. Yeah. So like, like he can reach stuff that others can't, you know, what is the bionic sloth or whatever they call him? Mm -hmm. Like that super long reach. And that, I mean, I, but that I, I think it's just that we have gifted and talented athletes in all populations. And so we're just, sometimes we're surprised by because like you're coming from this a disadvantaged circumstance but you're still so good Mm -hmm. like that's surprising to us but it's not necessarily like better or worse you know but it's it's certainly we have athletes an untapped potential yeah and if if i start climbing 515 c and i push you competitively right you're going to try and get that d and then you're going to try and get that 16 right and then but a, a bigger tent raises it because like when lynn hill did it and then all of a sudden 24 hours like boom 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 24 hours and now it's three hours or something stupid like that like for el cap right. i forget that no one sees what i'm doing so <laughs> i'm six seven and uh, i have long blonde hair um, <laughs> yeah i think widening that talent pool is another big reason to do this because we're all we all want to see the sport pushed forward right and if we restrict it to this one ethnic group <laughs> We're not going to see it pushed forward no. to the extent that it could if it were more diverse. We've seen it with every other sport. Yeah. Sure. And I feel like it's also doing a disservice to everyone. I mean, we're not getting the input from that community. I mean, there could be more technology that we don't know about that someone in uh-huh. the community we're not including has. Sure, sure. You know, yep. a different style of shoe, a different belay device. We know yep. whatever it is. Yeah. And then... Um, on that same note, that's a community, like you said, that isn't getting the benefit of climbing. Yeah. So they're not maybe reaching their own personal potential that raises the bar for the community at large. Right. And social issues or political issues or whatever it is. Advocacy for the so, outdoors. You know? Right. I mean, all of those things. Yeah. So, I mean, all of those things go hand in hand. And I feel like we're missing out, you know. On those on benefits. The, yeah. It's... um. It, it reminds me of something I talked with my wife about. It's uh, she has a bumper sticker that says, "Well-behaved women rarely make history." Yeah. And um, imagine how much further along we would be if we didn't suppress fifty percent of the population for the last four or five hundred years. Right. Right. Like, <clears throat> like cancer would be an afterthought. We'd be on Mars, and I'd be eating space bites. Right. Like with my tiny giraffe. <laughs> like that's the things that I would have. Like, wait, like it would be way cooler. And so we need to think about that with our sport, right? Like what, what, what kind of cam, like what kind of Velcro thing are we going to have next? Like, like those things were impossible just really recently. Like, Oh, there's, you have to use pitons and you have to use hammers and like you had to do that. And now it's like, Oh, that's crazy. Why would you ever do that? You know, and we're missing that. So yeah. And then the benefits of the sport, like I just can't echo that enough. Like, yeah, we're doing them a disservice and we're because we're lucky enough to engage means they're unlucky. Yeah. I think another important part of this is that 
even though you got this big grant, even though you're a scientist and you had all of this backing around you and knew the people to talk to, you still started relatively small. Mm -hmm. And and when you first pulled up the slide um, talking about Best Academy and and you said that it was 50 African-American males from 11 to 18. Mm-hmm. I was immediately like, why all, why all boys? Yeah. You know, what, what's the point in that? that? But you then came up with a phrase that says, that said, great is the enemy of good. Right. And, and I think that's brilliant because I often battle with this. Can I showcase and celebrate the women that I work with? Does that leave someone else out, you know? And what's that look like for my business? What's that look like for me? What's that look like for the women that I'm trying to celebrate or the people that I'm leaving out? There are all these scary questions. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit about great is the enemy of good? Right. It's um, it's like if I went to a, (laughs) it's a starfish poem. You guys know what I'm talking about maybe, but or poem or whatever. So um, there's a big storm off Oregon coast and there's a guy walking along the beach and he sees a little kid just flicking starfishes back into the ocean. And the guy runs up and he's like, you will never be able to save all these starfishes. It doesn't matter. And he's like, it mattered to that one. And he just kept throwing the starfishes in until he could, you know, until he couldn't do it anymore. And I think what we, um, what we sometimes lose sight of with like being woke or whatever it is, is like, there's so many shitty things in the world right now that I get overwhelmed. And so like, what can I possibly do? And I had a professor, um, his name's Razul Muat. He's at Indiana and he's a professor of parks and rec and of American studies. And he's a very wise, like he's a cool guy. And um, he said to me like, Ryan, just pick an issue and dive deep. And then the other things will reflect it. Right. So mm. if I if I go after like a gender equity, right, then I'm, I'm naturally I'm going to gravitate toward these other causes, too, because it, it's like a ripple effect that you have. Right. And so when I, when I picked Best Academy, it was because they were ready to go. Right. And um, their sister school, Coretta Scott King, I certainly want to start working with because right. we, we can't have the, the male African-American team that dominates. And then five years later, I add in the female team. Like we have to have those things emerge to together right um so greatest enemy of good is like i i i wanted 75 kids i wanted 100 kids but i could only get 50 because that's how many we could fit on the bus that we could afford well all right but that's going to hurt my power for my study so i needed a bigger sample size to to see marked effects of the participation in the program so i shifted my focus from oh we're going to assess this program for efficacy to assess it for implementation quality issues like what could we do better next time so I had to shift my focus. And so I couldn't be great. I couldn't be perfect. And so I just, but I went with it. And so it's, it's kind of working consistently. Um, and so, but if you wanted to tra- target Coretta Scott King, I would give you every single piece of resource that I have. And, right. uh, you know, every ba- piece of beta, I guess, on yeah. how to, uh, to do it yourself. Um, it's, I picked them because they were the group that was right at the right moment. Um, they're not necessarily better or worse than other groups. Mm-hmm. You have other questions on implementing it, Val? I know I keep just kind of taking over here. (laughs) That's what I do whenever I get a microphone in my hand. So no, I think um, everything sounds really. You know, you've already overcome a lot of the hurdles, so you've kind of set that stage for no, it can be done. So don't just immediately say, "Well, it's probably going to be hard," so I probably should try that next year. So. so that's great, like you said, in a couple of weeks when we, you know, get together and start this program. Yeah. But I realize that it's going to take time to get everything lined up and funds and all of that. But just having the... Um, conversation. The conversation, but the, like you said, the champion for yeah. that program. If you can identify is, her or right. him. <clears throat> yeah, I, mean, that's I think that's key. a huge that's a great part of first it. step, you know, well, to leave with action plan, well, with mm-hmm. an action plan and a first step and like, let me get after this and let me get emailing Tamara and yeah (laughs) Yeah. I think it's important as well something you said in the presentation for it to not be you Um, yeah to be someone else to to go out and find another champion right we at least I I'm speaking for everyone here when I say we but at least I tend to want to do everything myself and I'm like I could do that I could do that I could do that but in reality that job's going to get done way better if I let someone else do it and I focus on the thing that I'm doing and and I check in with them and I 
help them buy in and and I get them really excited about their job and then I can focus on mine. Right. Because when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else, right? Yeah. And so you're saying no to time with your family. You're saying no to whatever it is. And something that's going to take you three hours might take her 30 minutes, right? Yep. And so that kind of thing is really important. And so just developing that, that program champion is just, I mean, like what the big outcome here is, is like, we need to have that partner in the community. We can't be that partner in the community because right. they're the ones who have to advocate for it, right? And right. so that's a tiny bootstrap they can pull. Because if they have that intrinsic motivation, they'll get stuff done. But if you're just pushing them to get it done, then it's, and it's not fun then, right? Yep, totally. Like when you see Maria, if you ever get the good fortune of meeting her, um, like you'll see it like when she talks about these young men that she's you know, growing and right. like how climbing is so important to them. Like you'll see it and you'll know that's a program champion. That's what, there it is. Like, yeah. And that's the prototype. And um, I'm really just, I'm very lucky to have had that experience with her so far. Now, I'm, yeah, like now I need to find more. You yeah, know? yeah. Well, where can people find you, Ryan? Yeah. If they If they want information, if they want to talk to you about this, you're going to totally get inundated, but I'm okay with throwing you under the bus there. Yeah, no, so. that's great. So, um First, they should go to ryangagnon.com. <laughs> okay. And that's a real website. That's my, uh, it's where I share my research and my presentations. Okay. And I'll have Perfect. a version of the slide show that we have up there. And yep. some of it you can follow along with. Some of it you needed to be there. Yep. Um, but they, they need to send me an email. And that's the best way to get a hold of me. And there's two emails. Um, ryan at usaclimbing.org mm-hmm. or rjgagno at clemson.edu. Okay. RJ Gagno at Clemson. And I'll have all that linked oh, in great. the show yeah. notes right there on your, yeah, your that's phone great. Yeah. and also have it on the website. And so. like what my hope is from this conversation is that in 11 months, you and I are getting together about our presentation at CWA or whatever on how we screwed up a little bit less um, like <clears> in the, the Ohio project and in the Atlanta project. Like how did we get 12 people on a bus for eight weeks in a row? Like great. if we do that, that's a victory. You know, like I want a hundred, I want a thousand, but if we get eight, you know, that then that's a victory and we have to, how are we going to celebrate that here at CWA so we can have Valerie from Cincinnati, Ryan from Clemson and Washington State or whatever, and um, that, that that new person sitting here and having the same conversation. Like, yeah. that's that's the victory. And when I, when I put that in the presentation, that's when, like, when I get emails from people, like I handed out 50 cards today. Right. And if I get five emails from this conference and one of them turns into something, then this was worth me not being with my wife. This is worth me not exercising. This is worth me not being with my students. But if I don't, then that sucks, right? And then it's just window dressing again. Right. There was a so. long line. Yeah. After I saw. There was a really long line. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I, you know, I appreciate both of you sitting down and, and having this conversation because I think it's a really, really important one. And... I certainly got a lot of great takeaways just as a small business owner, as someone in a community where there are underprivileged or um, kids who don't have the opportunities and and some ideas that I'll take back to the people who I know are going to be those champions. Mm -hmm. Um, So I appreciate it a ton and I'm going to be totally okay being good, not necessarily being great. So it's better than nothing. Yeah, Yeah. totally. (laughs) Cool. Cool. Well, Well, thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank Valerie, you. Valerie, thank you. Seriously, this was great. That was really fun to do. It's just like debriefing the presentation. Because, you know what I mean? That's exactly <laughs> what I wanted out of it. First off, big thanks to Ryan and Val for making that happen. There are so many exciting things going on at CWA that it's, it's really tough to coordinate schedules. Um, but I think we all felt that this could be a really important conversation. Um, I talked to Val today. She's already getting the ball rolling on a similar program that she hopes to implement at RockQuest in Cincinnati. Um, If you're a gym manager, owner, employee, patron, whatever, uh, and want to start working toward a similar program, hopefully this gives you some inspiration and a good starting point. And don't hesitate to reach out to Ryan. Um, He's incredibly easy to talk to and to work with and he's he's dialing this thing in as we speak Um, and you can find his contact info right there in your show notes on that pocket supercomputer the rest of you 
send this episode to your gym managers or owners, um, people who can make it happen. We can't let hockey be more diverse than us. I mean, come on. All right, I got to get back to work. I've got a box of shirts here to put into stock, finger care kits to assemble, and actually, I don't have to do any of that anymore. That's Lana's job now. But all of you not in the U.S. can likely order directly through the site now, so go do it. Go do it right now. I do, however, have training plans to write, and if you'd like to train with us, you can find us at powercompanyclimbing.com. You can find us on the Facebooks, on the Instagrams. You can get inspired by photos of us on the Pinterest. I think that's how it works. And you can tweet at us all day, but we aren't going to tweet back because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this This time to build power. This time, 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 time to build power. This time the bill, 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 this time the b